Hello everyone. Today as it's between Christmas and New Year, I thought I would do a five story video for you. I've used the top five most liked videos during January and July this year. So without further ado, I wish you all a happy new year. Roger Dale Stafford was born on the 4th of November 1951 in Sheffield, Alabama. He was one of ten children born to Carrie and Samuel Stafford. His brother, Harold, was a year older than him, and little was known of their childhood. Of the two sources which I have found, one stated that the boys, together with their siblings, had a good upbringing in a good, solid family, whilst the other mentions that Roger was physically abused as a child. It is believed that at some point Roger joined the US Army and served in the Vietnam War. Roger married Werner and they had three children together. A son, also named Roger, and two daughters, Victoria and Candy. These children were placed with adoptive parents in Illinois, although it is unclear exactly when this happened. Jimmy Earl Berry was born in Collinwood, Tennessee on the 17th of November 1953, making him two years younger than Roger. Jimmy's family struggled for money, and by the age of 20 he was working as an assistant manager at a McDonald's restaurant to help support his mother and siblings, whilst also being a student at Florence State University, which is now known as the University of North Alabama. He was an intelligent, funny and charming young man who had begun dating a young woman who had left her high school sweetheart to be with him. Prior to the around-the-clock openings that we are so accustomed to today, back in January 1974, the McDonald's restaurant on Woodward Avenue in Muscle Shoals, Alabama, closed at midnight. In the early hours of the 12th of January 1974, three employees checked out of their shift, leaving Jimmy alone to finish closing up. Around 3am that morning, the cleaner arrived at the restaurant and was concerned when they found the side door open with the key still in the lock. As they entered the building, they saw that the safe was open and immediately called the police. Sergeant Roger Hall arrived just minutes later and when checking the premises, found Jimmy's body in a storeroom. Jimmy had been shot three times in the abdomen and once in the back, with this bullet travelling upwards and piercing his heart. Around $1,400 had been stolen from the restaurant and the investigators determined that around half of that amount would have been in rolled coins weighing in excess of £80. A murder investigation was launched and Jimmy was buried in Sheffield's Oakwood Cemetery. A reward was offered for information leading to an arrest and as time passed this was increased to $10,000 as local businesses contributed in an attempt to catch Jimmy's killer. Months turned into years without a break in the case. Suspicion fell on Jimmy's girlfriend's former boyfriend, the son of a well-known Colbert County businessman who had allegedly vowed to win back his girlfriend no matter the cost. There was no evidence to link him to the murder, and yet the cloud of suspicion remained. Four years later, another shooting occurred, this time near Purcell in Oklahoma. On the 22nd of June 1978, 38-year-old Air Force technician Melvin Lorenz was travelling from his home in San Antonio to Jamestown, North Dakota, to attend his mother's funeral. Together with his wife, Staff Sergeant Linda, 12-year-old son Richard and their two dogs, they headed along Interstate 35 in their blue pickup truck, which had a white camper shell. At around 3 o'clock in the morning, they saw a woman at the side of the road. The bonnet on her car was raised, and it appeared as though she had broken down. The Lorenz family pulled over to help, and when Melvin approached the woman, two men who had been hiding behind the car sprung out and demanded Melvin's money. When he didn't immediately comply, they shot him dead. Linda ran from the car to help her husband and was knocked down by the woman before also being shot. The shooter then heard a noise from the pickup truck and realised that 12-year-old Richard was inside. They raised the gun through the window and shot the young boy. Leaving Melvin and Linda's bodies at the side of the road, the killers then drove the truck a short distance with young Richard still in the back. 
possibly alive at this point, before dumping him out of the truck. They made off with just $600. Melvin and Linda's bodies were discovered later that day and Richard was declared missing. His body was found two days later less than a mile from where his parents had been found. On the 26th of June, the family's pickup truck was found in the car park of the Sheraton Inn near Will Rogers World Airport in Oklahoma. The family's two dogs had clawed their way out of the camper shell, Melvin's gun was missing from their vehicle and the police began working on the theory that the killers had flown out of the city. The investigation continued but stalled. Three weeks after the murder of the Lorenz family, a young man by the name of Carlos Joy arrived at the Sirloin Stockade restaurant in Oklahoma City to collect his girlfriend, Terry Horst, at the end of her shift. She popped out to see him, gave him a soft drink and asked him to wait in the car. As Carlos drove around the car park, he saw a dirty green station wagon with its engine running at the rear of the restaurant after waiting a while longer, he decided to go inside to see what was taking Terry so long. He called out her name, but no one answered. He assumed that the staff were finishing up in the office and returned to his car. However, as the time passed, he became increasingly worried. In his car, he had a CB radio, or Citizen's Band radio, which was attached to a loudspeaker, and through the microphone he said, The building is surrounded. This is the police. Little did he know that two men and a woman were inside having robbed the restaurant. They made their escape in the green car, heading to Interstate 240, where they collided with another car before driving away. At around the same time, the restaurant's manager started to become concerned that his assistant at the restaurant hadn't phoned in the receipts to the district office. The manager decided to visit the restaurant to check that everything was okay. When he arrived, he discovered that all six employees were in the walk-in freezer. All of them had been shot. Five of them were already dead. 17-year-old David Lindsay was a young man who was originally from Los Angeles. He had two brothers, attended Moore High School and the Pentecostal Holiness Church, and was active in Little League. David Salzman was 15 years old. He had one brother and was originally from Kentucky. 16-year-old Anthony too was a resident of Cape Charles and was living in Oklahoma for the summer. 43-year-old Louis Zacharias was the assistant manager of the restaurant and a married father of four teenage girls. And 56-year-old Isaac Freeman was a pastor who had been helping out at the restaurant by filling in for a night shift cleaner. Carlos also returned to the restaurant and saw his girlfriend, Terry in amongst the jumble of bodies in the freezer. Terry was still alive and rushed to the nearby Children's Memorial Hospital, but died an hour later. She had been a member of the Moore High School State Championship Girls Basketball Team and the First Methodist Church of Moore. She had two sisters and was just 15 years old at the time of her death. The criminals escaped with less than $1,300. The authorities were soon working on the theory that three people were involved in the murder at the steakhouse, two of whom were the shooters. As the investigation progressed, the police began examining links between the steakhouse murders and the Lorenz family murders. By early September, the link between the two crimes was proven when two guns and a holster were found in a paper bag by a young child in Oklahoma City. One was a 38 caliber Taurus that had been stolen from a Purcell pawn shop on June 21st and used to kill both the Lorenz family and also in the shootings at the steakhouse. The other was a 357 Magnum which was stolen from the Lorenz's car and used in the steakhouse murders. As more details of the two crimes were made public, a man came forward who recalled seeing a truck matching the Lorenzes at a petrol station in Stillwater on the night of their murders. He remembered two men and a woman and was able to provide composite sketches of them. They had stuck in his mind as he recalled that they seemed peculiar. In early January 1979, the composite sketches were released 
At this point, the police did not have any suspects in any of the murders. However, the following day they received a tip which would unravel the entire case. Roger Dale Stafford called them and identified two of the people in the composite sketches as his wife, Verna, and his late brother, Harold. Harold had been killed in a motorbike accident in Tulsa six days after the shooting at the steakhouse. It has been rumoured, but not confirmed, that he may have taken his own life. Meanwhile, Verna had had a massive falling out with her husband, which led to him downing two bottles of whiskey before making the call to the police to disclose her identity. It would take a couple more months before Verna was tracked down in Chicago, and arrested, at which point Roger was also identified as the third person in the composite sketches. He was arrested on the 13th of March 1979 in the lobby of the YMCA in Chicago. Verna bargained with the authorities and confessed to her involvement in the Lorenz and Steakhouse shootings, as well as providing details of many other crimes that Roger had been involved in during their time together. This included the murder of Jimmy Earl Berry. The police in Muscle Shoals officially issued a warrant for his arrest, but he was never prosecuted for this crime. He was, however, prosecuted for the Lorenz family murders and the six deaths at the steakhouse. Verna testified against Roger, and as part of her deal pleaded guilty to two second-degree murder charges, and, in March 1980, was sentenced to ten years to life in prison. At the first trial for the steakhouse murders, Verna claimed that Roger was the one who had herded the employees into the walk-in freezer and had then called his brother, Harold, a coward to goad Howard into helping with the killings. Verna also claimed that Roger had forced her hand onto the gun and made her squeeze the trigger. Meanwhile, Roger denied any involvement in the crime. On the 17th of October 1979, he was convicted of all six murders and sentenced to death. In February 1980, Roger went on trial for killing Melvin, Linda and Richard Lorenz. His attorney attempted to minimise his role in the murders, accusing Verna of trying to pin the crimes onto her estranged husband. However, the jury again found him guilty and he was sentenced to death for all three murders. After the verdicts were read out, he grinned, waved, and said bye-bye to two of his supporters, as though he did not have a care in the world. Werner and Roger divorced whilst he was on death row. Roger was initially scheduled to be executed in 1980, but many stays of execution followed, including one just 15 hours before the time that his execution was due. In 1986, while still on death row, Roger remarried, His new wife, Christine Romack, sought an annulment less than a year later after claiming that Roger had falsely convinced her that he would be a free man within nine months. Then, in 1988, he married for the third time. With the groom dressed in chains, the newlyweds were granted a three-hour non-contact visit to celebrate their nuptials. In August 1989, Having served almost 10 years of her sentence, Verna hoped to be released after a resentencing hearing. This certainly did not go according to her plan. An Oklahoma County District Judge resentenced her to two consecutive life terms after prosecutors told them that Verna had known in advance that the Lorenz family were going to be killed and that she had played a much more active role in the crime than she had previously admitted. The judge concluded by saying that there's one of the hottest corners of hell vacant with your name above it. After spending over 15 years on death row, firmly believing that his death sentence would never be fulfilled, Roger was executed by lethal injection on the 1st of July 1995. In his final moments, he reportedly spoke in tongues to his third wife. Roger never officially acknowledged his guilt, but Werner implicated him in a total of 34 murders in seven different states. 
it is believed that he may have confessed to many of these to his fellow inmates. With information that detectives have pieced together, they believe that he was involved in at least 22 other murders and may have been responsible for many more, potentially even as far away as England. Werner remains incarcerated at the Mabel Bassett Correctional Centre in McLeod, Oklahoma, whilst Harold is buried in an unmarked grave in Alabama. Whilst Roger was never convicted of Jimmy's murder, the reward money which had been offered to solve the crime was given to Jimmy's mother after Roger's arrest. That concludes today's story about Roger Dale Stafford. He was convicted of nine brutal murders and was potentially responsible for many more heinous crimes and paid for these with his life. He spent over 15 years on death row, waiting out the results of various appeals and legal procedures, and during this time he married not once, but twice. This got me thinking and debating with my fellow true crimers. Should any prisoner, whether they on death row or otherwise, be allowed to marry during their time serving their sentence? Is this a human right which should be extended to all regardless of their criminal status or should they lose the ability to marry at the same time as they lose their freedom? I'd love to hear all your thoughts and comments below. Psst, in Sheffield, Alabama, there is a famous recording studio called Muscle Shoals Sound Studio. Over the years they've had many stars record there such as Aretha Franklin, Wilson Pickett, Joe Cocker, and the Rolling Stones. Goodbye. For today's true crime narration, we shall be looking at a Scottish cold case from 1978 in which the perpetrator was finally brought to justice early in 2023. Brenda Page was born in Ipswich, England in 1946. She was an exceptional student who gained a first-class honours degree in zoology from University College, London. Then, she followed that with a PhD in genetics from the University of Glasgow. While studying for her PhD, she met the man who would go on to become her husband, Christopher Harrison. Originally from Ripon in North Yorkshire, Christopher was also a scientist having studied at Queen's College, Cambridge, before moving to the United States where he was a tutor in biology at Harvard University, Massachusetts. He then returned to the United Kingdom where he worked at a Glasgow Virus Research Centre. The couple married on the 6th of May 1972 in Brenda's hometown of Ipswich. The following year, Brenda was appointed the principal of the genetics department at the University of Aberdeen Medical School. Christopher continued his studies in Edinburgh before joining his wife in Aberdeen, where the pair bought a house in Mile End Place, a short walk from the university. Brenda was an extremely well-respected scientist who was at the beginning of what would likely have become a brilliant career in medical research. In stark contrast to her thriving academic career, her marriage was a source of great unhappiness and problems for the young woman. Christopher was abusive, controlling and violent towards Brenda from an early stage of their relationship. Brenda's older sister Rita had said that Brenda described her marriage as walking on eggshells, adding that Christopher could be very unpredictable. He was either very nice or very nasty. Brenda was hospitalised on more than one occasion after Christopher had assaulted her. The abuse continued throughout their marriage and the couple separated in 1976. It was Brenda who left the marital home whilst Christopher remained living there. Brenda moved to a small flat on Allen Street. It was a quiet residential street near the city centre and had initially tried to hide her new address from Christopher. When he found out where she was living, she applied to the courts for an order to keep him away. This worked for a while until the couple's divorce became final in October 1977. On or around the day of the divorce, Christopher turned up at Brenda's flat where he hurled abuse at her. He then threw crockery around the room and threatened to kill her. Rita. Brenda's older sister recalls Brenda saying that she thought her husband was stalking her at around this time. 
A close friend and colleague, Jesse Watt, also said that Christopher would follow Brenda everywhere and that Brenda found it very stifling. He was obsessive about her. Now living alone, other than her three cats, Brenda was struggling for money and in 1976 answered a newspaper advertisement searching for women to work as escorts. It is more common today for the term escort to suggest sex work, but back in 1978 this was not the case. An escort was simply employed to meet and socialise with men in order to earn extra money. There was absolutely no suggestion that Brenda had slept with any of these dinner dates, nor that she was involved in sex work in any form. Her family were fully aware of her second job. Brenda enjoyed meeting new people and dining in nice restaurants. And Rita would later recall that Brenda had told them about her job and we had a laugh about it. She said she was going to have some nice dinners and meet some nice friends. However, she did keep this part of her life a secret from her work colleagues as she was unsure how it would be received within her academic circles. Brenda would often work in her laboratory for very long hours, from early morning until late into the night, but on Wednesday the 13th of July 1978, she left work early in order to get ready for a night out. Together with another female escort, she had made plans to meet two businessmen at the Treetops Hotel in Aberdeen for dinner and drinks. The second woman never arrived, and Brenda left the hotel bar at around 2.30 a.m. One of the men offered her a lift home, but she declined, instead making the short journey to her Allen Street flat alone. On Thursday the 14th of July, Brenda did not arrive at work. With no contact explaining her absence, Brenda's colleagues became concerned. Eventually, they alerted one of her neighbours, an elderly woman by the name of Elizabeth Gordon, who held a spare key to Brenda's flat. When Elizabeth entered the flat that day, she discovered Brenda's clothed but battered body lying on her blood-stained bed. Brenda had been beaten repeatedly and had suffered over 20 head and facial injuries. Soon after, Rita opened her front door to be informed the devastating news that her younger sister had been beaten to death. Rita was then left with the traumatising task of breaking that news to their mother. The police believed that the killer had forced open a rear window the previous evening, climbed inside and lain in wait for Brenda's return. Robbery was dismissed as a motive as nothing was missing and the two businessmen who Brenda had spent the previous evening with were questioned and ruled out of the inquiry. Her ex-husband, Christopher, was almost immediately the main suspect in the murder. Elsa Christie, an acquaintance of Christopher, said he had phoned her a short time earlier and had said that he was going to kill Brenda. Brenda's sister, Rita, had been given a letter by Brenda which was labelled, to be opened only after my death. In this letter, Brenda wrote, If I depart this earth rather suddenly, do please make sure that I get a good post-mortem. And the letter went on to state that she wanted her sister and nephews to be her beneficiaries. Within hours of the murder, Christopher was apprehended, but due to insufficient evidence, he was released from custody without charge. Six days after the murder, Christopher issued a statement through his solicitor expressing his sincere and heartfelt grief at the death of his former wife and that he hoped the killer would soon be caught. Brenda was laid to rest in Ipswich, where her mother would join her 14 years later after she passed away at the age of 83. The investigation continued with the police appealing for help in searching for the blood-stained clothes which would have belonged to the killer. A search was launched in Edinburgh for a dark green duffel bag which the police believed may have contained these clothes along with the murder weapon. It was thought that the bag may have been dumped in Edinburgh's university area but it was never found. Appeals for witnesses led nowhere and eventually the case went cold. The forensic evidence was carefully preserved and this would ultimately lead to the killer's downfall over four decades later. In February 2015, 
Lord Advocate Frank Mulholland instructed the Scottish police to reinvestigate the case. Witnesses were re-interviewed and numerous different forensic organisations were used to analyse the DNA available. Over a period of years, a conclusive case was formed. Semen found on a duvet in Brenda's flat matched Christopher's DNA profile and was said by a forensic expert to be 590 million times more likely to be from Christopher than any other male. Paint flecks from the point of entry were found to be a match with those in Christopher's car. Meanwhile, Christopher claimed to have no knowledge of the paint flecks and also stated that he had never had any physical contact with his ex-wife in her flat, ultimately sealing his fate. Christopher maintained his innocence, but was charged with Brenda's murder in March 2020. He was released on bail. The case eventually went to trial in February 2023 at the High Court in Aberdeen, after 10 days, the eight men and seven women of the jury took just two and a half hours to reach a guilty verdict. Now 82 years old, Christopher showed no emotion as the verdict was read out. Judge Lord Richardson sentenced Christopher to life in prison with a minimum term of 20 years before he would be eligible for parole. Brenda's nephew, Chris Ling said that the family was absolutely delighted at the verdict and that not a day goes by when we don't think about Brenda and the horrendous ordeal she must have suffered that night. Whilst it is incredibly satisfying that justice has finally been served in a case after almost half a century, it is still heartbreaking to realise that this man has had the opportunity to live freely for all of this time and will only spend his twilight years paying for the crime that he committed. Whereas Brenda, by all accounts a brilliant and extremely likeable scientist, had her life cut brutally short, leaving all of her potential unrealised. That concludes today's case. Please click like, and if you're new to the channel, please consider subscribing. Psst, a famous alumni from Brenda's workplace was J.J.R. McLeod a co-discoverer of insulin and a joint winner of a 1923 Nobel Prize. Goodbye. For today's true crime narration, we shall be looking at an English case from 1986 that shocked the nation both for the level of violence involved and when the police uncovered the perpetrator. Paul and Jean Sutcliffe were a married couple who lived in Westbury in Wiltshire with their four children, 15-year-old Linda, 14-year-old David, Anna, who was seven, and their eight-month-old daughter, Heidi. 44-year-old Paul was a mathematics teacher at the Kingsdown Comprehensive School in Warminster. French-born Jean was 39. She had been a religious studies teacher before having children and went on to run a sewing business from the family's five-bedroom detached home at The Butts in Westbury. Jean was a gifted seamstress who attracted customers from miles around who were looking to alter wedding and bridesmaids dresses for which she charged an extremely reasonable price. Both Jean and Paul were regular attendees at the All Saints Church in Wiltshire. The morning of Wednesday the 30th of April 1986 was like so many others in the Sutcliffe household. Jean waved goodbye to her husband and also the three oldest children as they headed off to school. She then went out with baby Heidi and ran a few errands in town before returning home shortly before lunchtime. Paul and the children returned home at around 4.20pm that afternoon and as they went inside, 15-year-old Linda headed towards the sewing room. It was in here that she discovered the bodies of her mother and baby Heidi. Both had been brutally murdered. Subsequent investigations established that Jean had been hit with a blunt object three times on the back of the head. She then suffered multiple more blows to the head and face as she lay helpless on the floor, after which her throat was slit with such force that she was almost decapitated. Baby Heidi had been killed by a single blow to the throat, which had again been performed with such force that she too was almost decapitated. Once Jean and Heidi had both bled to death, their bodies were placed onto their backs, lying next to each other with their arms touching. 
A tea towel had been placed over the fatal wound on Heidi's neck. A massive police investigation began. There had been no signs of a burglary or struggle at the house and it was believed that Jean had opened the door to her murderer. Due to her sewing business, Jean would often have visitors at her home and the police were keen to speak to the drivers of three cars that were seen near her house on the day of the murders. A white pickup truck, orange Morris Marina and another unknown amber coloured car. The owners of the first two cars came forward and were ruled out of the inquiry, but the owner of the third remained a mystery. In the Evening Standard on the 2nd of May, the headline read, Shopping Trip Theory of Murder Hunt Police. Did Double Killer Follow His Victims? The last time that Jean had been seen alive was at 11.30pm on the 30th of April when she was pushing Heidi in her pushchair along Westbury High Street. Appeals were made for anyone who had seen them to come forward. There seemed to be no motive, no evidence of a break-in. It didn't appear that anything was missing from the house, although, understandably, Paul was too distressed to return to the house to confirm this. There was no evidence of sexual assault and no murder weapon. Reports emerged of a neighbour seeing a shadowy figure hovering near the kitchen window on the Wednesday afternoon. Newspapers reported that the police wanted to speak to a woman who was about 5 foot 3 inches tall, around 60 years of age, with short grey hair, wearing a grey coat who may have been seen outside the Sutcliffe's house on the day of the murders, and also that they were looking for the driver of a gold B-Reg Ford Cortina. His description was a man in his 40s who was around 6 foot tall with dark wavy hair and square framed glasses. To outsiders looking in, it appeared as though this had been a random attack with no motive and no suspect. However, the police knew differently. On the 7th of May, the news broke that someone had been arrested in connection with the murders. At around 10pm the previous evening, a 49-year-old woman from Westbury, who police had previously spoken to as part of their inquiry, had been taken into custody. An undercover operation had been underway, where the police officers posed as bin men collecting and sifting through the rubbish of selected homes in the village. This was just in case the killer attempted to dispose of the murder weapon. Heather Arnold was one of those who the police were observing. Heather worked alongside Paul at Kingsdown Comprehensive School, where she was also a mathematics teacher. The pair had developed a close working friendship. Four years earlier, Heather's 24-year marriage to a Royal Air Force or RAF officer had acrimoniously broken down and Paul, and to a lesser extent his wife Jean, had provided Heather a shoulder to cry on. Jean had even been the one who had helped Heather find the two-bedroom bungalow where she lived after her divorce. It was less than 300 metres from the Sutcliffe's home. Seven months after moving there, Heather's daughter, Jane, got married and moved away. Heather became increasingly lonely and in turn increasingly dependent on Paul who would help her out with odd jobs around her bungalow. The evening before the murders, Heather and Paul had been talking on the phone when he had to break the conversation off as an estate agent had arrived to value his home. Paul had become disillusioned with the teaching profession and was planning to leave his job and set up a sewing shop with his wife, perhaps leading Heather to believe that he would be leaving her life. Whilst Paul and Heather were close professional friends, he had no idea that she saw him as anything more than that. Heather was unpopular with colleagues and neighbours. She was a strict school teacher who was seen as cold and calculated. She had few friends and couldn't stand the thought of Paul leading his life without her. During the police operation, an undercover officer posing as a bin man collected black sacks of rubbish from outside Heather's property. When doing so, she went to throw a white bag full of rubbish directly into the bin lorry, but the man offered to do it for her. The lorry was stopped and searched before the rubbish could be compacted and the white bag was found to contain three charred pieces of an axe handle. Meanwhile, Heather was in a panic and drove the hundred or so miles to her daughter's house in Stone, Staffordshire. 
When she arrived at the house, she was clearly agitated and showed her daughter, Jane, a small axe head which she had hidden in her skirt. Heather told Jane that she had nothing to do with the murders and that she had found the axe in her garage and attempted to dispose of it through fear. Perhaps believing her mother, or maybe through concern that her mother was possibly involved, 26-year-old Jane called the police and Heather was arrested. During the police interviews, a senior detective stated that Heather showed no signs of nervousness and was sufficiently cool to give an appearance that she was in no way involved. The axe head had been thoroughly washed, preventing any blood tests from being carried out, but the handle parts revealed traces of blood, singed hair and paint particles which linked it to the crime. Although Heather confessed to the murders shortly after her arrest, she later, on the advice of her solicitor, withdrew this statement. There were angry scenes outside of the courthouse when Heather appeared on a charge of murdering Jean and baby Heidi. Due to the investigations and post-mortems, it was over five weeks until Jean and Heidi could be laid to rest. Hundreds of mourners packed the All Saints Parish Church in Wiltshire to say their goodbyes. Heather's case started at Bristol Crown Court on the 1st of April 1987. Detective Constable Caroline Enright testified that Heather had told the officers in the car after her arrest that she had gone to the house carrying a chopper but she was crying and worried about what her daughter would say. She said that she had taken the murder weapon home and washed it. When they asked why she did it, she allegedly replied, I do not know, I just did it. However, in a later conversation with officers, she denied being at Jean's house and said that she couldn't believe that anyone could do something so dreadful, particularly to a baby, and that she knew nothing of the killings. The defence argued that there was not a single piece of forensic evidence that would enable the jury to conclusively say that Heather was guilty. No fingerprints, no blood on her or her clothes, no fibres linking her to the crime scene. They claimed that the prosecution had just presented a selective case. Paul stated that he had no idea that Heather had feelings for him and only viewed her as a friend. He felt that she might be jealous as she had a rather empty existence and that he had a fairly chaotic family life which I clearly enjoyed. On the 15th of April 1987, after deliberating for around seven and a half hours, the 11-person jury returned an unanimous guilty verdict. Heather collapsed in the dock as the verdict was read and she was sentenced to life in prison. Heather was sent to Broadmoor Hospital. It's a high-security psychiatric hospital where she admitted to psychiatrists that she hated Jean and had killed her because she wanted to be closer to Paul. In 1993, a consultant psychiatrist at the hospital said that she should appeal her conviction on the grounds of diminished responsibility at the time of the murders. The appeal court was asked to either order a retrial or to substitute the guilty verdict with one of not guilty of murder, guilty of manslaughter by reason of diminished responsibility. Lord Justice Hobhouse dismissed this appeal in February 1996 stating that before her trial, Heather underwent psychological tests and no relevant abnormality was found. After the original trial, Paul told a news conference that he and his three children were now trying to rebuild their lives. They planned to stay living at their home and also that he would continue teaching. However, the following year, in March 1988, it was reported that Paul was going to remarry he had left his teaching job and would be selling the house where the murders took place as he and his new wife planned to buy a new house to start their life together. That concludes today's case. Psst, a punk band called Kicker wrote a song about Mrs Arnold, or Heather, as she actually taught the lead singer of that band. Goodbye. For today's true crime narration, we shall be looking at the case of Katrine da Costa, one of the most shocking cases in Swedish criminal history. Katrine was born on the 19th of June 1956 in Lulea in North Sweden. The family moved to Stockholm where Katrine attended school. She had planned to become a hairdresser, but whilst in high school, she became addicted to drugs. This eventually led to her dropping out of school 
living on the streets and turning to sex work to fund her addiction. As Katrine approached her mid-twenties, she started to turn her life around. In 1979, she moved to Portugal, where she got married and had a son. Despite her best efforts, she struggled to keep her addiction under control and eventually had to abandon her life in Portugal and move back to Sweden. Before long, she was once again working in the red light district to fund her addiction. Katrine was fully aware of the dangers involved in her line of work and tried to mitigate this by taking care with the clients that she accepted, always trying to avoid particularly dangerous situations. However, as her addiction spiralled further out of control, she began taking greater risks, taking on clients who were known to be abusive towards women. In June 1984, Katrine disappeared. Her mother alerted the police after becoming concerned that she had not heard from her daughter for a few days. It was soon established that the last time Katrine had been seen was on the 10th of June getting out of a stranger's car that was parked by the roadside in the red light district, Malmskilnadsgatan. It would take a month of anguish before Katrine's mother received the news that she had been dreading. Katrine's body had been found. On July the 18th, the police had discovered parts of Katrine's dismembered body hidden in a bin bag dumped under a bridge at Karlberg's Beach in Solna, located just north of Stockholm city centre. It was unclear how long Katrine had been there and the police had to identify her by her fingerprints. Her head, internal organs and genitalia were all missing and have never been found. It was impossible to determine her cause of her death. Three weeks after the first discovery, another bin bag full of body parts was found less than a mile away from the first one. With news of these horrific discoveries being widely reported, a series of protests and rallies against violence towards women followed. Feminist activists, backed by a nation, demanded justice. The Stockholm police found themselves under immense pressure to progress the investigation and to deliver results. The case became known in Sweden as Stick Murder, the cutting up murder, and ultimately led to a change in the law, which meant that men who paid for sex were criminalised. An initial theory based on the dismemberment of the body and the removal of the organs was that the killer may have been a surgeon or certainly someone who was from a medical background and skilled with a knife. The first suspect questioned by the police was Dr. Tiet Hayerm, a pathologist at the Department of Forensic Medicine at the Karolinska Institute. The doctor was known to be a violent man, with many of his former colleagues describing him as cold, arrogant and creepy. However, none of this had stopped him from advancing to the top of his field. He was considered a leading mind in the world of forensic medicine. There was a further alarm bell found within the doctor's past. Two years prior to Katrine's murder, Teet's wife, Anne, had been found hanged in their bedroom. The couple were in the process of divorcing at the time. While this case had been reported as a suicide, many believed it was murder. Just two months after his wife's death, the doctor published his first medical paper that focused on strangulation. This was considered by many to be both unusual and callous, considering the nature of his wife's death, a death that he seemed cold and unaffected by. However, with no evidence to the contrary, her death remained classified as a suicide. The police showed a photograph of Teet to women working in the red light district and dozens of them recognised him, with several stating that he had been violent towards them. The police arrested the doctor and took him in for questioning. Whilst he initially tried to deny that he had ever visited the red light district, he later admitted that he had frequented the area and had also paid women for sex. Even though there was a great deal of suspicion around him, he was released from custody five days later as there was no physical evidence linking him to Katrine's murder. Another primary suspect was Dr. Thomas Algen, a general practitioner who was reported to the police by his wife on an unrelated matter. His wife Christina accused him of child sex abuse, claiming that he had abused their one-year-old daughter. 
The police investigated this allegation, but no evidence was found. Despite this, Dr. Aldrin was now on police records and would become a suspect in Katrine's murder. It was in 1985, almost a year after her death, that the police discovered that both doctors were acquaintances and had in fact worked together from 1980 to 1981. It was Dr. Aldrin's ex-wife who alerted the police to the connection between her husband and Dr. Teet Hayam. As the investigation of the two men progressed, Christina claimed that her daughter, who was still just a child, had said that she had witnessed the dismemberment of Katrine by the two men. Both a child psychiatrist and a psychologist were engaged by the police to examine this evidence and both reportedly found it to be credible. It was now the working theory that both doctors had conspired together in the murder. In a completely unrelated crime in February 1986, the Swedish Prime Minister Olof Palma was assassinated near his home in Stockholm. As a consequence of this, this meant that the police resources, which would have otherwise been put towards solving the Katrine da Costa case, were now redirected towards finding the Prime Minister's killer. While thousands of man-hours were devoted to the Prime Minister's assassination, the person responsible was never found. As such, it wasn't until the autumn of 1987 that there was a breakthrough in the investigation into Tiet and Thomas. It was reported that years before, the two men had gone to a photo shop close to where they worked to have a camera film developed. The owners of the shop claimed it showed images of a decapitated and dismembered corpse. The shop owner stated that the men, who by this point had been identified as both the doctors, claimed the photos were part of a top-secret investigation that they were assisting the authorities with and as such, the photo shop owners had never contacted the authorities about what they had seen on the film. With this new information, the police now believed that they had enough evidence to convict the two doctors, and the case went to trial in January 1988. The prosecution was built around the information provided by the photo shop owners, and that which Dr. Aldrin's daughter had reportedly seen. The defence was quick to discredit the child as a possible witness, stating that the evidence provided by a child who was just 18 months at the time was not reliable. It was claimed that the child told her mother they threw the head away and then the lady was chopped up. It would seem unlikely that a child of that age would have been able to articulate what she had seen in such a way. The defence then proceeded to discredit the testimony provided by the photo shop owners. They said it was ludicrous to say that two doctors would visit a shop to develop disturbing images of their victim and risk getting caught for her murder. The trial was a media sensation and reported far and wide. Both Dr. Teet Hayum and Dr. Thomas Aldrin were eventually found guilty of the killing of Katrine da Costa. Due to the intense media interest and pressure from activists, the integrity of the trial was questioned and ultimately the High Court declared a mistrial that saw the two men walk free from prison. This was again met with anger and disgust from the nation, with many seeing this as another example of the rich and powerful getting away with murder. At the second trial, the Swedish National Board of Health and Welfare were tasked with ascertaining the victim's cause of death. However, due to the poor condition of the remains, this was not possible. They were unable to say with 100% certainty that Katrine da Costa had indeed been murdered, and as such, both the doctors were then found not guilty of the murder charge. Although acquitted in court of the murder, their innocence was by no means confirmed. The trial judge even declared that despite it not being possible to prove the two doctors were responsible for Katrine's murder, he was convinced that these men had cut up the body. They could not, however, be sentenced for this as the statute of limitations for that crime had expired. The result of the trial divided the nation Many questioned how a body that was found dismembered was not a murder victim, whilst others echoed the fact that no physical evidence was ever found that linked the two men to the murder. 
stating that the case against them was built around speculation and personal vendettas. Following the trial, the two men filed claims for compensation, but both were swiftly declined and numerous legal attempts to strike the remarks of the judge have been unsuccessful. In 1989, both Teat and Thomas were barred from practicing medicine and neither of the men have really worked since. In more recent years, DNA testing has proven that a hair found on the dismembered body, which is believed to have belonged to the killer, did not come from either of the doctors. As a result, it is now more commonly believed that the two doctors were innocent of this particular crime and their lives were destroyed by their association to it. If these two men were not guilty of Katrine's murder, then how did she die? One theory relates to a Polish butcher by the name of Stanislaw Gnurka. Three months before Katrine's body was found, Stanislaw was released from a psychiatric facility where he had been serving a sentence for the murder of a young woman in 1974. The young woman was strangled, cut up into pieces before being disposed of in rubbish bags. As was the case with Katrine, this young lady's head was never found. Stanislaw was known to regularly frequent the red light district in Stockholm and was known to the police to be very dangerous, particularly when drunk. Many of the women who worked in the red light district said that they knew of Stanislaw and he frightened them. However, he was dismissed as a suspect at the early stage of the investigation for unknown reasons. He died in 1987. In 2009, 25 years after Katrine's murder, the statute of limitations on the case ran out that means that no one can ever be tried again for this crime. As such, it would always remain one of Sweden's most notorious murder mysteries. That concludes today's story. Please subscribe if you're new to the channel and remember to click like and comment down below. Today I'm going to give you the post message earlier than usual and that is that this case was the inspiration behind the publication of Steve Glasson's The Girl with the Dragon Tattoo which was titled Men Who Hate Women. Thanks for listening to the channel. Stay safe. Goodbye. For today's true crime narration we shall be looking at three brutal murders that took place in 1997 that still haunt the small community of Powell in East Tennessee some 25 years later. By all accounts the Lillilid family were good people. Vidar was born in Bergen, Norway in May 1962, the youngest of four children and then moved to Florida when he was in his 20s. In the US, he met the woman who would ultimately become his wife, Delphina, who was born in New Jersey in March of 1969. The couple married in February 1989 in Miami, Florida, and had a daughter the following year, who they named Tabitha. After Tabitha's birth, the family looked for a peaceful place to raise their children away from the big city. They decided on Knoxville in Tennessee. Their son Peter was born in 1995 and by the end of 1996 they had moved from their apartment into their dream home. It was a 50 year old house in the Powell community where they had plans to renovate an annex for Delphina's mother. Vidar worked as a bellman at the Holiday Inn Cedar Bluff in West Knoxville whilst Delphina remained at home to raise and homeschool their two children. The couple were deeply religious and devout Jehovah Witnesses. On the 6th of April 1997 they attended a religious convention at Freedom Hall in Johnson City which was around 100 miles away from where they lived. The family travelled home after the convention in their 1987 Dodge minivan heading south on Interstate 81. Just before 7.20pm that evening they pulled into the rest area at mile marker 41 around halfway through their journey. Two-year-old Peter was suffering from an earache and was feeling restless so Vidar took him for a walk whilst Delphina and Tabitha headed to the toilets or restrooms. On the way there Delphina stopped to chat with a friend Karen Sinclair and her teenage daughter Cara who were also heading home from the convention. Vidar and Peter were waiting by the door at the visitor centre when two young girls came out. 
Fidel smiled at them and asked if they believed in God, to which they replied that they did not. Two young men then joined them, and when Vidar asked them if they would like to learn more about God, the man said that they would. The two young men, 20-year-old Joseph Risner and 14-year-old Jason Bryant, along with the two women, Natasha Cornett, who was 18, and 17-year-old Karen Howell, headed over to the picnic area with Vidar and Peter, who had now been joined by Delphina and Tabitha. Vidar began talking through the basics of the Jehovah's Witness faith, whilst Delphina waved goodbye to her friend, Karen. Shortly afterwards, Joseph went over to his car, where two other friends, 19-year-old Edward Mullins and 18-year-old Crystal Sturgill, were waiting. Joseph returned to the group, pulled out a 9mm gun and said, I'm sorry about this. Everybody just be quiet and nothing's going to happen to you. All we need is the van. Joseph knew that his own car, a blue Chevrolet Citation, was on its last legs and had seen the family arrive in the minivan just a few minutes earlier. Joseph had also picked up a speeding ticket an hour or so earlier as the group travelled through Gate City in Virginia. That, together with the fact that they had stolen two guns and some money before they had left their hometown of Betsy Lane in Kentucky, meant that they needed a reliable car to make their escape before their families and the police caught up with them. With the gun in hand, Joseph ordered the family to return to their minivan. Vidar offered to give the group his wallet and keys, but they refused. The family were forced into the van with Natasha, Karen, Joseph and Jason. Vidar was made to drive and as they pulled out of the rest area, Edward and Crystal followed them in Joseph's car. All six of the group had extremely troubled pasts. Broken homes, academic failures, emotional and sexual abuse, drug use and alcohol were all common themes in their lives. Two days earlier, they had stayed at the Collie Motel on US-23 in Pikeville, Kentucky, where they had started to burn 666 in the carpet. They all took part in seances and satanic rituals, and it was believed that it was here that their sinister plans may have begun to take shape. They returned to Natasha's trailer after the motel stay and told her mother, Madonna Wallen, that they were going to start the Armageddon, with Karen adding, the end of time is coming. On Sunday the 6th of April, the group went to the home of a police officer where Jason created a disturbance outside to distract the officer. Other members of the group then entered the home taking two guns, two boxes of ammunition and around $500. Natasha was said to be desperate to escape her life. She claimed to have spoken to angels and demons since the age of four, was obsessed with witchcraft and would refer to herself as Satan's daughter. She had threatened her mother with a knife and would tell her friends that she had dreams of living out one of her favourite movies, Natural Born Killers. From a young age she had been drinking alcohol and using illegal drugs such as heroin, ecstasy and cocaine. Natasha was extremely close to Karen. Karen grew up in a violent household and claimed that she was sexually abused between the ages of 5 and 10 by both her uncle and cousin. She had a fascination with the occult and witchcraft and also regularly used illegal drugs. Joseph, who was the oldest of the group, had been a good student up until his mother and stepfather's divorce. He then started drinking and using drugs He had previously been dating Natasha, but was now dating Karen. Natasha was dating another member of the group, Edward, who seemed to have the most normal life of the six. He was working towards his GED, or General Educational Diploma, and had a job at a grocery store. However, once he became involved with Natasha, who he was planning to marry, his behaviour deteriorated significantly. Jason, the youngest, was already on probation and despite his young age had a long history of drug and alcohol abuse. He had an IQ of around 85 and his emotional and social skills were said to be severely underdeveloped. It was reported that he had let Natasha carve her initials into his arm to show his strength and gain credibility with the others. Crystal was fairly new to the group. She performed fairly well at school, but suffered emotional neglect at home. 
In December 1996, she accused her stepfather of sexual abuse and was thrown out of her house. She ended up living with various different people over the following few months, including Natasha. As the groups travelled south on the I-81, Delphina attempted to keep her children calm by singing to them until Jason ordered her to shut up. Young Tabitha even offered Karen one of her chocolates during the drive. Shortly before 9pm that evening, two calls were made to 911 reporting gunshots on Payne Hollow Lane in Greenville. Someone who lived nearby said that they had heard shots and seen two vehicles pull up but only one leave. The second person, a contractor working on a water tower, heard two bursts of gunfire, one after the other, followed by a muddled commotion, like children on a playground. Deputy Jeff Morgan and his supervisor arrived at around 9pm. They initially saw the headlights of a blue Chevrolet Citation at a strange angle in the road. It had clearly been abandoned, having got stuck on top of a stump in the mud. The car was empty and the number plate had been removed. It was what they found in a ditch next to the car which would stay with them forever. Four bodies, a man and a woman with a young boy and young girl lying on top of them. Six-year-old Tabitha was lying on top of her father, Vidar, and two-year-old Peter was on top of his mother, Delphina. All four had been shot and Vidar and Delphina's legs had been crushed by tyre tracks. As the police investigated further, Tabitha made a slight movement and was rushed to hospital. Doctors at the University of Tennessee Medical Center in Knoxville worked through the night trying to save the little girl, but she was pronounced dead the following day. Meanwhile, Peter was laying across his mother's body with his face in the mud. As Deputy Jeff Morgan turned him over, Peter let out a cry. The deputy sat and held him until the ambulance arrived and Peter was also rushed to hospital. He survived, but had suffered severe spinal damage lost an eye and it was thought that he would have suffocated had he been left in the mud much longer. At the autopsy, Dr Cleland Blake concluded that the family had been lined up along the ditch and shot one after the other. It is believed that Vidar was killed first. He was shot in the right eye, an injury that would have rendered him unconscious immediately. He was then shot four more times whilst lying in the ditch. Delphina was originally shot in the left arm and then the left leg. Neither of these wounds were fatal. She was shot six more times and it is believed that she was most likely alive during the subsequent attacks on her children and when she was run over by the minivan. Tabitha had been shot once in the head. Peter had been shot twice. The first bullet entered his head behind his right ear, exiting through his right eye. The second bullet hit him in the back. When trying to escape, the Chevrolet Citation had got wedged on a tree stump, so the six perpetrators jumped into the minivan, driving over Vidar and Delphina as they rushed away. Despite the number plates of the Citation having been removed, the vehicle identification number allowed the authorities to trace the owner. This was Joseph's mother, Mary Castle. She then told the police that she hadn't seen her son in two days and did not know where he was. However, she did know who he was with and she gave the police the names of the five other members of the group, all of whom were missing as well. The police now knew exactly who they were looking for and the car that they were travelling in. Less than 48 hours later, at around 5pm on Tuesday the 8th of April, a 1987 Dodge was stopped at the checkpoint at the US-Mexican border in Douglas, Arizona. The occupants had failed to show the correct paperwork and were claiming that they were lost. When asked who the van belonged to, the driver, Joseph, shrugged and said that he didn't know. The group were ordered out of the car and placed under arrest. They were taken to Cochise County Jail where, when the booking officer asked Natasha her religious preference, she replied, Satan. They were found to have several items belonging to the Lily Lid family in their possession. Natasha had a piece of Vidal's belt and a picture of Tabitha in her purse. Karen had a Hello Kitty diary lock which belonged to Tabitha and Crystal had the keyring to the Lily Lid's family home. None of these items had any value, so it can be assumed that they were trophies from their kills. District Attorney Barclay Bell 
sought in media extradition for the group so that they would return to Tennessee to face trial and made it known that he would be seeking the death penalty for the four adults involved. The juveniles, Karen and Jason, were facing potential life sentences without the possibility of parole. Outrage over the mindless and random killings was intense. In Knox County, a convenience store owner hung six nooses on a scaffold in front of his business, claiming that he was against lynching but pro-capital punishment. A crowd chanting burn in hell had assembled when the four adults were escorted by deputies back to Greene County. Criminal Court Judge Eddie Beckner denied repeated defence requests to try the six separately. He did, however, rule that finding a fair jury in Greene County would be impossible, and as such a jury would be bussed in from Bradley County, which was about 150 miles away. The trial date was set for March 1998, however the trial never came. In February that year, all six defendants pleaded guilty to the charges of murder and attempted murder as part of a plea deal to avoid the death penalty. The actual truth of who fired the fatal shots and who did what on April the 6th remains unknown. Each of the six tell differing stories of what happened after they arrived at Payne Hollow Lane and those close to the case struggle to fully believe any one version of events. Natasha, Karen and Joseph all maintain that it was 14 year old Jason who was the only shooter. They said that once they exited the van, there had been an argument over what to do with the family, at which point Jason started shooting. In the opinion of many, the idea of a single shooter does not match up with the forensics, and some believe that there were at least two shooters using the two guns. Jason claims that the other three made up the story when it was realised that he would not be facing the death penalty and would potentially have a lighter sentence due to his age. He claims that it was Joseph and Edward who had fired the guns that night. By most accounts it was agreed that Crystal, who has always maintained that she did not hurt anyone, did not leave the car during the shootings. However, as part of the deal, all six were given the same sentence. Three consecutive life sentences without the possibility of parole, plus an additional consecutive sentence of 25 years in prison for Peter's attempted murder. Appeals were filed for Karen Howell and Jason Bryant due to the later US Supreme Court decision that restricts the imposition of life sentences on juveniles. These appeals have been denied and all six still remain in prison in Tennessee. After lengthy hospital treatment, including a prosthetic eye and numerous complicated surgeries and also a custody battle between Vidar and Delfina's families. Peter eventually went to live with his father's sister in Sweden. He has recovered significantly but not fully from his injuries and returned to live in the US where he is now married and works in IT. That concludes today's story. Please subscribe to the channel, click like and add any comments down below. Thank you for listening to The Crime Reel. Stay safe. Goodbye. Psst. In Knoxville, there is a 266 foot structure that was built for the 1982 World Fair. It has a 75 foot gold coloured glass sphere at the top. Goodbye.